Well, good morning and welcome to a special edition of The Bouncing Act Presents, Behind the Mystery of Gervais Syndrome, a rare form of epilepsy that's difficult to manage for the patient and their family. Today, a comprehensive guide featuring four key perspectives. Carrie, the mom of a child with Dravet syndrome, Dr. Linda Lux, a pediatric epileptologist, Mary Ann Meskus, executive director of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, and Nicholas Couturier. He is the CEO of Biocodex. It's a company that manufactures a treatment for Dravet syndrome. Well, we're going to start the story three months after Carrie had given birth to her second child, a daughter named Kaylee. I want you to take a look at this. first seizure that Kaylee had, she was in her car seat and her right arm just went up and she started pumping her fist and then her arm went down and it just wasn't having any movement and that's when we know she needed some medical attention. When we got to the ER, they did a lot of different tests on Kaylee and that was when we first heard the word seizure and heard the word epilepsy. Over the next few months, Kaylee continued to have seizures. They increased in frequency and duration. And we tried different treatments and didn't seem to lead us down a path of success. At any time, she could have a seizure that can take her life. You're always on a high alert. You are always making sure you have a plan wherever you are to keep her safe when a seizure does occur. When Kaylee was less than four months old, she had her first generalized tonic-clonic seizure, which causes a loss of consciousness and violent muscle contractions. To see your child suffering and out of control and possibly injuring herself and knowing what this was doing to her brain and her body was something no one could prepare you for as a mother. After her first initial generalized tonic-clonic seizure, we were home and it happened again and again and again. We would try treatment after treatment and weren't getting answers of why is this keep happening. The seizures started to affect Kaylee. My once bubbly, happy, laughing, smiling little girl and with all of the treatments, I started to see her just kind of be still. And that is a difference that really made my heart break. The Balancing Act met with Dr. Linda Lux, pediatric epileptologist at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Dravet syndrome is a rare form of epilepsy. The seizure onset is at one month to 18 months of age, most kids will have their seizures begin in the first year of life. The first seizure is typically a convulsive seizure, either affecting the full body, which is then called a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, or half of the body, which is called a hemiconvulsion. These first seizures can often be prolonged and may be triggered by a fever or illness. Subsequently, Kids can continue to have the generalized tonic-clonic seizures and hemiconvulsions, but they will develop a multitude of other generalized and focal seizure types. Each child will have a different experience in terms of their seizures and seizure evolution, although the intractable treatment-resistant seizures and the developmental impairment is the core of Dravet syndrome. Other things that you will see for these children that will affect their quality of life include subsequent developmental impairment, as well as intellectual disability, walking or gait concerns, coordination issues, behavior problems that can include impulsivity, wondering, um, autistic-like features, sensory integration disorders. They can have disturbed sleep, growth and nutrition issues, there are many things that Dravet syndrome consists of beyond just the seizures. Children with Dravet syndrome have a 15 to 20% mortality rate and a very high incidence of SUDEP, which is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, in which the child will die in their sleep. When I realized that we were getting treatment after treatment and Kaylee's seizures were increasing in frequency and duration. I just realized there had to be something else. 
and knowing that getting a genetic test could be something that could give us more answers was something then that needed to take place. At nine months old, we found out that Kaylee had the genetic mutation for the SCN1A gene. We then learned that all of the treatments we had been supporting her with to treat epilepsy was actually increasing her frequency and duration of seizures. And I was shocked. I was numb. I was overwhelmed. And my vision of her future changed. The path that I thought our family was on changed. But then I realized I just need to learn everything I can to help support her and we will do whatever it takes to help Kaylee on her battle with Gervais. Gervais syndrome is diagnosed by a clinical constellation of signs and symptoms. You have the seizure onset that is typically in the first year of life. You have the varied generalized and focal seizures. You have seizures that are prolonged and are intractable to medication treatments. Initially, the child will have a normal development, um, neurologic examination, MRI scan, and normal or nonspecific EEG findings. Approximately 80% of the patients with Dravet syndrome will have an SCN1A mutation that codes for the sodium ion channel that's important for the transmission of signals between the nerve cells. Now it should be noted that you can have the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome and not have an identifiable SCN1A mutation on laboratory testing. You can also have an SCN1A test that shows a gene mutation, but not have the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. So while it's highly associated, there is not a one-to-one -one correlation. Genetic testing is available for free for children up to eight years of age through the Invite.com Behind the Seizure program. It's very important for the early diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. This will determine the best seizure medications for that child and seizure medications to avoid. When we come back, the CEO of Biocodex and the executive director of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, they're going to join us in the studio. Absolutely. So don't go away. We'll be back right after this. Founded in France in 1953, Biocodex is a family-owned multinational pharmaceutical company dedicated to providing education and support in the field of Dravet syndrome. And here with us is the CEO, Nicolas Couturier. And also joining us to discuss funding and finding better treatment options is Mary Ann Meskis, who's the executive director of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much for being, being here. here. Good morning. Absolutely. Nicholas, let's start with you. Let's talk a little bit about Biocodex's commitment to rare disease in the community and why it's so important. Thank you and thank you for having us today. So Biocodex has developed a uh, global expertise in the field of uh, pediatric neurological in rare diseases. And uh, the aim is to provide services and treatments for unmet medical needs. So we want to make sure that the communities around the world uh, can have access to treatments and, and solution. This is what we, we fight for and this is one of our mission. That's fantastic. Now, that's the company's commitment. I want to talk, Nicholas, about your personal commitment, because I know you're very passionate about this. When, uh, when I took uh, my position as CEO of Biocodex, it was a year plus ago, I had the chance then to, to meet a lot of uh, families that are affected and impacted by um, uh, Dravet syndrome. And uh, it has always been extremely inspiring, you know, meeting uh, people and, and, and people like Marianne, mother and father, you, you, you sometimes you wonder what, what if it was me. And it so hits it, home. It, it hits home. It totally it, it hits homes. And hence, it has been very, very inspiring and, and had an impact on, on, on myself. And I've urged and, and I've asked the team to, to be extremely committed as well to support these communities wherever they are around the world besides the United States. Marianne, I know you have a very personal connection with your son, Elliot. Would you mind sharing your story? Sure. So he is now 22. When he was about six months old, he had his first seizure, and it took until the age of four for us to get his diagnosis. Oh my and back then, if you did an internet search to learn more about Dravet syndrome, there were three hits. All of the outcomes were pretty grim. There just wasn't much known about the disease. 
And so, you know, at that point, I just felt like I needed to do something that would help my son as well as the other children that would come after him. You were one of the founding members of the Jay Finch Syndrome Foundation 13 years ago. Now, what's the foundation done to help increase everything from funding, research, and drug, you know, approvals and participation in clinical trials? Yeah, well, when we started, our founders were all parents who came together and said, what can we possibly do? Um, this disease often leaves you feeling that you're not in control or have any power. So this was a way for us to do something constructive. And we kind of looked at the landscape and we recognized there wasn't a lot of research happening that was going to have to be patient community driven. So we started by offering uh, small research grants to researchers so they could collect data to go on and get larger incremental funding. And then also to draw more researchers into the field. And then after that, we also recognized we really needed to bring all of our stakeholders together. So we wanted to have our researchers, our clinicians, our patient families, all kind of as a centralized hub. So as things move forward, we had the ability to help move that needle forward. And Marianne, weren't there drugs developed because of all that perseverance? Yes, we've been really fortunate as a rare disease. We've had three new drugs approved in the last four years for wow. our syndrome mm -hmm. and more in clinical trial. Nicholas, I was reading here and I, I love this. You know, when companies partner with advocacy, mm -hmm. I think it's so important. Biocodex partnered with the Dravet Syndrome Foundation to create Navigating Life with Dravet Syndrome. Tell me a little bit about, about that and why that partnership is so important. Well, it's very important because, you know, who, who better than the Dravet Syndrome Foundation and, and parents like, like Marianne can tell us about the daily challenges, the unmet needs, etc. So we've been partnering for over a decade with the Dravet Syndrome Foundation and we find that it's uh, very important and, and again, very inspiring and it uh, nutrishes us with, uh, with information and data that we need to know. And, you know, it's our number one responsibility towards patients and to other families to, to, to provide them with, uh, with good solutions. And the Dravet Syndrome Foundation is the perfect link. And it works both ways, right? I mean, the foundations to private industry, right? Right. And we're so appreciative because we feel that the patient voice should always be front and center in anything that's being developed. You know, we're the ones who understand our unmet needs and our daily challenges. And so when you have a willing partner that can help out, it really makes a difference. And our families feel that they have others fighting with them in this. Well, we have much more to talk about. So when we come back, and this is a quick break, we're going to talk about how Mary Ann helped Carrie cope with her daughter's diagnosis. People helping people. Love that. And much more from Biocodex when we come back. So make sure you stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Biocodex CEO Nicholas Couturier and the executive director of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, Mary Ann Meskus. Nicholas, what inspires you to continue to fight for this community, and, and how do you make sure your employees kind of stay on the same page and fight for them too? Well, nothing but the story like uh, we have seen earlier. You know, when, when you see uh, the story of this uh, little girl, Kylie, uh, you know, trying to fight in order to, to uh, go to school and so on, it's nothing but inspiring. And when I see that, I, I know that I'm in the right business. And, you know, every um, patient with uh, the Dravet syndrome is a new story, but it's always the same inspiration. And uh, since we're helping this community for over a, a couple of decades, we want to make sure that we continue in that direction. And that's so important because when you are diagnosed with a rare disease, you feel so alone and you feel like nobody can understand. And the fact that Carrie shared that you met with her after Kaylee's diagnosis, I mean, that's just so special. Tell me about that one-on-one -on -one support, what it meant to her and what it means to you. Yeah, there's really a lot of strength in our community. And one of the things we tell our newly diagnosed families is make sure you connect so that you have the opportunity to share advice and ask questions because it's really a very difficult medical journey that you'll be navigating for the rest of your child's life. And so, you know, it's an honor to be able to meet families like Carrie and just share what our experience has been and help mentor them along the way. Nicholas, any final thoughts? Sure. You know, we've done a lot, but there is much, much more to do. And the last thing I want to say is that these patients and their families deserve organizations that are committed in finding innovative treatments. I want to thank you both for this discussion. It's so important. I mean, just the awareness on Dravet syndrome. I wasn't even aware of this rare disease. I've learned so much. The community coming together, the treatments. I mean, bravo. Thank you thank so you. much thank for you. what you Absolutely. do. Thank you very well, much. Let's go back to hear more from Carrie and how the impact of this meeting really, really affected her. That's right. Take a look. Once Kaylee was diagnosed with Dravet, I researched the Dravet Foundation and reached out to Marianne Meskus, who went out of her way to drive to meet me, to tell me her story about her son, Elliot. And for the first time, I didn't feel alone. 
And I've been so grateful that she stayed connected throughout all these years, not just as an advisor, but as a friend. We had our first appointment with Dr. Lux after Kaylee was diagnosed. And it was told that she may or may not walk or talk. There may be regression. There may be behavioral concerns. And she may have developmental delays. She was real, told us what could come, but in the same manner made us feel comfort knowing that there was support and she would be there for us to do that. The goals of seizure treatment is to keep the child safe, to have the least amount of seizures possible and shorter seizures. The ultimate goal is to maximize the child's developmental potential and to maximize their quality of life. Because this is a treatment resistant epilepsy, many of these children are on more than one medication. All of these seizure medicines have side effects, and they have side effects that affect the brain. So you do have to go through a trial of medication therapies to find the best combination of medicines for that particular child. Despite new, very good medication and treatment options, children are still having seizures. Therefore, we desperately need new medications and treatments for these children. With all of Kaylee's treatments to help support her seizure control, we started seeing behaviors such as impulse control occurring. We saw attention being an issue. We saw her mood changes. And we also saw her in a haze. But we also knew she needed these treatments to help limit the seizures. Through the years, I've treated many patients with Dravet syndrome, like Kaylee. And oftentimes, especially at the beginning, the journey can be very difficult when you don't understand why this is happening, when they are having very frequent and very prolonged seizures. Certainly the hope is that with better seizure therapy, tailored specifically to that child, they'll have less frequent seizures, shorter seizures, and therefore will be able to have better developmental outcomes and quality of life. There are comprehensive epilepsy centers that do specialize in taking care of children with Dravet syndrome across the United States. In addition, there are incredible family advocacy groups such as the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, where you can get a lot of support and education for yourself and for your child. In addition, the Epilepsy Foundation is an organization that provides support, education, and needs for anybody with epilepsy. I do wanna emphasize for any family whose child has recently been diagnosed with Dravet syndrome, the extent of research, new medications, and new trials that are currently ongoing that will hopefully change the natural history of this epilepsy syndrome. The big green bear. As a family, we talk about Gervais with Kaylee. She knows she has it. She knows that she has seizures. She knows what a seizure is. She knows how much she is supported. Kaylee's a rock star. Kaylee also is my hero as well because every day she does what she can even though I know it's not easy for her. My hope for Kaylee is just that she's healthy and happy and most of all knows how much she's loved and supported. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of The Balancing Act behind the mystery of Dravet Syndrome. And for more information on Dravet Syndrome, you can visit biocodex.us. And for resources and support, you can visit DravetSyndromeFoundation.org. You can also visit our website, thebalancingact.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you.